Welcome to the Longmont Museum, a center for culture in Northern Colorado where people of all ages explore history, experience art, and discover new ideas through dynamic programs, exhibitions, and events. My name is Justin Veach. I'm the manager of the museum, Stewart Auditorium, and we are coming at you live and direct from the Stewart this evening. I want to wish everyone a happy Earth Day, a really happy COVID Earth Day 2021. And I'd like to thank all of those who make our programming possible. The Scientific and Cultural Facilities District, the Stewart Family Foundation, the Friends of the Longmont Museum, and our many museum donors and members. We simply couldn't do all that we do without you, so thank you. For more information about all that we do here or to find out about how you can support the museum's work, please visit longmontmuseum.org. Tonight, Earth Day. We conclude our four-part big picture climate change series with Earth, Ground for Innovation. So uh, co-presented by the mighty KGNU Community Radio out of Boulder, Sustainable Resilient Longmont, and the City of Longmont Sustainability Program. The series has been wonderfully co-curated and the panels deftly moderated by none other than our than journalist and co-host of KGNU's How on Earth, Susan Moran. All this week, the Stewart Auditorium has served as, a clim as climate change central with each night dedicated to a different element. On Monday, we explored air, Tuesday was on fire, and last night, we tussled with water. And tomorrow, uh, tonight, we wind things up with Earth. Each program features a panel comprised of climate change scientists and other experts sharing what they've learned about these vast and shifting realms. The week's programming culminates with Sustainable Resilient Longmont's annual Earth Day celebration on Saturday, featuring virtual offerings for children and teens and ending with a panel discussion on climate change, diversity, equity, and inclusivity in the evening. Uh, that program will actually be broadcast in both English and Spanish. You can find out more info on Sustainable Resilient Longmont's Earth Day programming at srlongmont.org. All of our programming can be viewed on the museum's live stream page as well as Facebook and local Comcast cable. For those of you viewing on Facebook this evening, you're invited to submit questions to our panelists in the comments field. We'll do our best to get to as many as we can during the Q&A portion at the end of the program. Now, without further ado, Allow me to introduce the co-curator of the Big Picture Climate Change series and our moderator, Susan Moran. Susan is a freelance journalist and editor and a host and producer of How on Earth, the KGNU Science Show. Her work has been published in the New York Times, The Economist, Biographic, Nature, and more. Susan was an adjunct journalism instructor at CU Boulder for seven plus years. She has served on the board of the Society of Environmental Journalists, was a Knight Science Journalism Fellow at MIT, and a Ted Scripps Fellow in Environmental Journalism at CU Boulder. She was previously on staff at Reuters in Tokyo, New York, and Silicon Valley, Business 2.0 Magazine, and other news orgs. She's got a couple of masters, one in journalism from Columbia University, and another in Asian studies from UC Berkeley. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Susan Moran back for our grand finale of our Big Picture Climate Change series. Thanks so much, Justin, and thanks to the Longmont Museum and our sponsor, KGNU Radio, for making this series happen. I'm so honored to have this distinguished panel of folks who I'll introduce in a sec, and also want to reiterate, happy Earth Day. It's a gorgeous day here in Colorado. So I want to start just with the ground beneath our feet. So as with, wa as with water, our very existence depends on soil, a living regenerative system and it's taken a heavy hit. In fact, I'm wondering how much we've learned since the Dust Bowl of the 30s. Last December, some of you probably know, the Union of Concerned Scientists published a report that said the following. If soil continues to erode at current rates, US farmers could lose more than eight times the amount of topsoil lost during the Dust Bowl. So much of our topsoils has been eroded by destructive farming, grazing practices, as well as from drought and rising sea levels, and of course, rising carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. And we're experiencing unprecedented destruction of the Amazon and other tropical forests, widely called the lungs of the planet. And it's not just an environmental crisis. It's a human health and a national security crisis. 
Whole communities around the world are increasingly being forced to migrate from ravage and contested land, and their safety is at risk. And meanwhile, we're in the middle of the so-called sixth extinction of wildlife species. But it's not all doom and gloom, as, you'll, as we'll discuss tonight. So tonight's panel is also going to explore solutions, those that are happening now, or approaches, and, and possible ones for the future, both on farms, in cities, and globally. Many folks, including those on the panel, helping to build a healthier future for our kids and the planet. So as we crawl out of this long, dark tunnel of COVID, this seems like an opportune time to take stock, to listen, to learn from each other, and to create new possibilities for living with nature, which really means living with each other. And we want to learn from you as well. So as Justin alluded a bit ago, um, please ask questions. I guess the only way you can is via Facebook Live in the chat, but we will by 8.30, maybe before, start opening up to questions. So thank you so much. And I want to introduce this great panel. First, we have joining us from Mumbai, India, is Dr. Adrei Bhattacharya. And where I think the sun has just risen, hopefully she's caffeinated, right? I think it's about 7 o'clock in the morning there. She's a research faculty at CU Boulder in civil, environmental, and architectural engineering and in the Center for Asian Studies. Dr. Bhattacharya is also a visiting researcher and adjunct faculty at IIIT, or Indaprastha Institute of Information Technology in New Delhi. She's a paleoclimatologist studying the nature and causes of long-term climate variability, as well as the role of climate shifts in social upheavals, such as migration, displacement conflict, and epidemics over the long term in semi-arid regions. And Dr. Bhattacharya is also a science writer and she participates in educational and non-governmental outreach efforts focused on climate communication, climate sciences curriculum, climate literacy, and climate adaptation. So nice to have you. And next Thank we you, have Dr. Yeah, sorry, Dr. Keith Postian. He's the University Distinguished Professor in the Department of Soil and Crop Sciences and Senior Research Scientist in the Natural Resource Ecology Laboratory at Colorado State University. His work includes modeling, field measurement, and development of assessment tools for soil carbon sequestration and greenhouse gas emissions from soils, including right here in the Front Range. Dr. Postian was one of many recipients, including Al Gore, of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize for his role as an author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, report particularly related to land use, greenhouse gases, and climate change mitigation. Thanks so much for being on the panel. Thanks. And next we have Alice Madden. She is Executive Director of CU Boulder's Getchus Wilkinson Center for Natural Resources, Energy, and the Environment. She practiced law for a decade before running for the Colorado House of Representatives in 2000. Very, very bold. <laughs> and she won, of course, in 2001, well, 2001 to 2009. She served in the Colorado House, representing the 10th district around Boulder. And from 2005 to 2009, she served as majority leader. She also served as climate advisor and deputy chief of staff to then Colorado Governor Bill Ritter and later at the Department of Energy, U.S. Department of Energy, as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Intergovernmental and External Affairs. Thank you so much. And finally, we have an actual farmer, Mark Gutridge. <laughs> he and his wife, Kenna, who's in our audience, who is our audience today, <laughs> at least the actual one, they own Olin Farms in Longmont, in fact, just a couple miles from here. And they grow 200 and something varieties of vegetables and sell directly to individuals and families, mainly through their CSA, or Community Supported Agriculture. The farm has expanded to leased property in Boulder County open space. Mark and Kenna have launched several programs, including one called Project 95, which we'll hear about tonight, to educate and inspire young farmers and to promote regenerative agriculture. Mark earned a master's degree in water resource engineering from the University of Colorado. He has said that he plans to farm for the rest of my life. 
or until I can't move. Looks to me like he's moving a hell of a lot these days. So Maybe this afternoon. I think he's with us for a while. <laughs> so thank you all again so much. And we're going to start by having all four of them give up to five minutes of opening statements with some really cool visuals. So Dr. Bhattacharya, how about you first? Thank you, Susan. Let me share my screen. Uh, are you able to see my screen? We can hear you. Um, hi, everyone. Good evening. Good morning for me. And um, happy Earth Day. Uh, it is certainly a time that we take a stop as we get out of this dark tunnel of COVID, as Susan said. And while we do that, I think it doesn't, it is not completely out of context to really think how small events with, you know, small risks can actually spiral out of control very quickly, uh, but also can be contained fairly quickly. So on your screen is, um, is on the x-axis, it's a figure of, that shows average global temperatures over the last 500 million years, a little more than that. This is the entire time that the earth was populated. Uh, this is the entire time that the earth needed to populate it with its biodiversity that we currently have. In red are periods which saw warming and in blue are periods that saw global cooling. Uh, and when we say global cooling, how do we know that it's cool? Because we have evidence that there are there were polar or ice caps in the cold world. We call it the ice house world. And there was there used to be a world without polar ice caps. And if you notice, um, each of these greenhouse sort of worlds that we know were completely different, very unlike the world that we have, that we see today. Um, think about it: no ice caps. And each of these periods as you can see, lasted several hundred million years. And those of you who can't quite think of million in time, that has six zeros. Uh, so temperatures rise and fall, but not over days or decades, but over millions of years. So it's a slow process. The Earth takes time. Uh, fast forwarding uh, a little bit to more recent times, and by recent, this is 100,000 years. Uh, this is the time when the world became, started getting populated by migration from East Africa. In black, here you can see these numbers. These are the average ages when recorded migrations happened. And the red digits are those that, that tells us about halo groups or DNA markers that allow us to sort of understand where different groups of humans moved and how. But on the bottom, you see a reconstruction, isotopic reconstruction in ice core over the last 100,000 years. And you see some ups and you see some downs. When you see the downs, you know that that was cold and dry, and the up was warm and humid. So all of these migrations were most in fact, not, if not all of these migrations happened or coincided with warm and humid phases. Uh, during cold and dry phases, particularly, the, uh, it was very difficult for people to migrate. And we call these geoclimatic bridges or times. Uh, one of the things that we want to say is if you notice the last 10,000 years or so, you see that the world transitioned into a more stable, warm, humid climate, much like the one that we know today, uh, when a lot of human societies, civilizations rose. Uh, they were all agrarian societies, and, and primarily they took advantage of the stable climate uh, and therefore could devise uh, techniques in order to till the land and live. Uh, and therefore, when we fast forward in, or, or zoom into this last 10,000 years, what we see is emergence of agriculture. 
uh, or agriculture as we understand today. Some of the, so you can see some of these earliest sort of uh, places where agriculture emerged where China, they were in Asia, uh, also Papua New Guinea, and then slowly sort of uh, uh, in the rest of the world, uh, the, the most recent ones would be, uh, as you can see, are Sub-Saharan Africa. These are all semi-arid today, but they weren't like this 10,000 years ago. For example, Sub-Saharan Africa was thought to be green. So, so small climate shifts within that last 10,000 years, which, which could seem today very little compared to the first figure I showed you, was good enough for reorganization, not just of agriculture or how we eat and store food, but for civilizations that rest on this principal agrarian idea. Uh, and there are two things that was uh, very important for agriculture, water and soil. And uh, civilizations, we have ample evidence over the last 10,000 years from archeological, climatological, and historical studies that Societies that manage their water resource and soil resource well, were able to survive uh, uh, any sort of climate shift and prosper. And societies that did not uh, pretty much spiraled out of control in, time, uh, in, in uh, conflict and resulted in vast scale migrations out of those regions. So Susan said, today's Earth Day and we need to think about water and soil. Um, so if we think about this complex climate society interaction, as Susan said, that it's not just an environmental catastrophe, it is a human catastrophe today. And here is why. So the climate system has, in built into this climate system are long-term changes, which are exceedingly slow. And then extremes and hazards that come about randomly. Uh, and what, do that, what does that accomplish? that really impacts biophysical effects on plant growth, human and animal growth, all sort of very important for basic agrarian patterns. And that has sort of complex, and I wouldn't say we understand it complex, completely, all the details that is, but we do know that there are very strong economic feedbacks, demographic feedbacks, population moving, as I have just said, and then a small crisis now and then will have huge political feedbacks. I just mentioned conflicts and crises when uh, societies have not been able to manage their soil and water. So uh, when we look towards the future, uh, the way we are currently going, um, we are not on a good trajectory. Uh, it's expected that we will definitely have about two degrees Celsius, 1.5 degrees Celsius for sure, more like two degrees Celsius warming average temperature of the earth, which is the first figure that I showed you. And experts, hundreds of them, if not thousands of them have worked together to figure out that if we have a degree Celsius warming, small to moderate impacts, meaning things we can manage, if we exceed the two degrees Celsius uh, average, then we have moderate to high impacts and that becomes unsustainable. At four degrees Celsius, high to extreme impacts, we, we quickly start, we start seeing extreme displacement, migration, conflict, epidemic. Just to put some of the numbers on some of these extremes that are causing some of the worst economic damages, a drought, floods, uh, high temperatures, uh, untimely storms, biological uh, disasters such as infestation, wildfires, um, and some of the biggest uh, impacts are going to be in Asia, Africa, Latin America, including. So remember, these are the places that saw the earliest advent of uh, agriculture and continues to be some of our biggest food producers. And, and, and agricultural sector is one of the biggest employment sectors in the world. Um, just to give you a sense of uh, a two degree Celsius world, which we are most certainly going to see, uh, on the top panel is the average population density across the world. And some of the most populated centers are also some of the earliest agrarian societies. So the peopling of these societies were very much tied to that climate stabilization that led to the agrarian culture. 
Dr. Now, Bhattacharya, I'm in, sorry to interrupt, but um, can we hold some of this for the discussion? I just wanted to keep everyone's to five minutes oh, to make yes. sure we have um, enough time for conversation. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, next, we have oh. Dr. Keith Postian. Take it away. Okay, thank you. Let's see, how do I queue up? Oh. Okay, well... Thank you again for the opportunity to come here tonight. Um, I want to give a quick overview of, of agriculture and, and, uh, and soil carbon, greenhouse gases, what, and, and, and climate mitigation. How, you know, how is agriculture really both contributing to and, and potentially uh, you know, a, a partial solution to some of our climate challenges? Uh, first thing to note is that uh, most people wouldn't wouldn't necessarily think about it, but uh, but actually, agriculture and land use uh, activities are, are are quite a large greenhouse gas source. Uh, and if you look at it collectively, it it accounts for almost a quarter of the greenhouse gas emissions on a on a global warming uh, basis. And uh, the other thing to note, so about 25%, about half of that is really due more to uh, deforestation, often done as part of agricultural development in, in, in the tropics, but uh, the other part is, are, are gases that are associated with agricultural activities. And over on the right-hand side, you see a cartoon there that just really depicts the other thing to note, and that is that, that really, Agricultural activities give rise to, to multiple different types of greenhouse gases. It's a very complex picture, and, uh, and, and it's a challenge, as I'll get into later on, to, in terms of how, how do we quantify these. Um, the, you know, where this plays in, though, is, is also looking at, at emissions going forward. And, and here's a, a little bit of a complex-looking diagram, but, but you see a red line there, and you see a, a yellow line. And this is really looking at, at global greenhouse gas emissions. And the, the yellow line at the top that goes and peaks sometime about uh, 2050 or 2060 is, is kind of the business-as-usual emissions of greenhouse gases, and uh, and the red line is is really the trajectory in terms of emissions that we want to achieve if we're going to keep uh, global temperatures below the two degree uh, limit of, of of global warming that the Paris Accords, for example, have done. So how we get there is interesting. It's it's uh, it's going to require first this this whole area that's in the the light green color or fossil fuel emissions that need to be you know we need to reduce we we need to uh, get away from fossil fuels. But also there are other non CO2 greenhouse gases and in order to really attain this this red line we're also going to have to actively take carbon dioxide that we've already put into the atmosphere and take it back out and put it somewhere. And uh, one, of the, one of the areas that we can, um, that we can do that is, is by putting it into soils. And by putting it into soils is also gonna be a tremendous uh, benefit in terms of, of uh, improving soil fertility and, and sustainability. Uh, so how, how do we manage soils to do this? It's all about managing the carbon balance uh, CO2 comes into, uh, into the ecosystem via photosynthesis, plant residues, uh, pl roots, etc. But then there's also a return through the respiration of, of microorganisms that, that return CO2 out uh, back to the atmosphere. But what we want to do then is really to increase the rate of, of carbon that we put into the soil, reduce the rate or increase its, its residence time there. And we can do this either with, the, with a lot of different uh, conservation technologies in terms of how we manage soils, uh, but we can also potentially do this with, uh, uh, with new things, new plant types, et cetera, to, to, uh, to increase soil carbon. Um, how much can we do? Well, that's, uh, you know, a lot of people have, have written uh, papers about this. We don't know exactly, but we can calculate from looking at experimental evidence that we have in, in, in field experiments and somewhere on the order of about, uh, uh, you know, three to five billion tons of CO2 equivalents per year could be what we, 
we could t capture and remove from the atmosphere. <clears throat> in order to do that, we're going to have to have farmers like Mark and others uh, changing practices uh, and, and, uh, and really contributing to a new carbon economy, different ways to incentivize uh, folks to do that. A crucial uh, test for, uh, for research, though, is, is to really be able to quantify greenhouse gases and, and, and carbon. Uh, that's part of the work that I do. And it's, uh, again, it's a complex system. We're going to have to use uh, a number of different tools, measurements, models, remote sensing, et cetera. And, uh, and, and so in order to do that, we're, we're going to be uh, uh, really having to have a different kind of agriculture. And I think the other, I think Mark will be talking about and some of the other speakers will talk about how, how we really are going to change our land use practices in order to achieve these, this kind of a goal. Thank you so much. Alice Madden's next. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Justin. Um, I am smart enough when I'm following two climate scientists and preceding a farmer to stick what I know uh, best, and that is policy and politics, and hopefully how to get people to support better policies. So hopefully my slide deck will come up in one moment. But a question I keep getting um, is how happy should we be? <laughs> we, we're in a new era. Uh, we have a new administration who, are, are, there's a flurry of activity, executive orders, we're back in the Paris Agreement. Today was a huge day, uh, but we still have a split Senate. So I am an optimist, but I also know how hard it is to actually get things done. Uh, but the message I want for the audience is this is no time to temper your expectations. We deserve to demand the audacious, the in, indomitable efforts that it will take. Uh, we are well beyond any kind of tipping point we have tipped. So it's no time to be um, shy. Um, keep marching, keep calling, keep volunteering, and of course, keep voting. So a lot of people ask me, you know, there's. We, we know what we want to do. How do we get these things passed? So I wanted to just mention a little bit about the homework you have to do when you're advocating for something. Um, and you are, you're watching this, you're thought leaders. You might not know it, but by watching this, you are thought leaders. And with that power comes great responsibility, as Spider-Man's uncle said, so don't forget that. And uh, the important thing is when you are talking to someone, you have to know where they are coming from. It's disrespectful if you don't, but think about uh, how you communicate to them. Some, there's social science that shows some people really are, are, are more comfortable with stability um, and conformity. So if you go in talking about innovation and creativity, they shut down. Um, you have to create relatable context. Why should I care about this? At the end of your conversation with someone, you hope they stand up and say, oh my God, how can I help? And you might not be the, might re the right messenger. You might have to relate to other people or bring up other supporters, um, like the Pentagon says this, or my uncle who's a farmer, or my minister says we have to be good stewards of the earth. So really think about how you will reach that person. And climate change is overwhelming, and sometimes you feel like you can't do anything about it. So it's always really important to talk about that bright future. What is this all worth? What will it be like if we do everything we should do? And then provide that, the pathway with real solutions that people can relate to. So I think you've all heard, of, and I made up this word, which I really like, sequesterer, earth as sequester. Uh, you heard about 30 by 30, I believe. Um, this is one of Biden's plans. Uh, we only protect about 12% of our nation's land, and we're going to reach 30%. There's two big problems with, not problems, but concerns I want to raise, is we have public, um, we have extraction of oil and gas in our public lands, and in 2018, 500 million metric tons of greenhouse gas were emitted from our public lands, and we have grazing on our public lands, and grazing um, cows are the biggest emitter within the ag community, um, so we need to think about what we're going to be doing with grazing. Um, ending deforestation, 
This is something that's so important. We must work on this. Um, and I just jotted down a few things that, that you can do to, um, to help end forestation. Um, and I'll just note one, do not buy anything with palm oil. And uh, the rest are sort of self-explanatory. Um, and I wanted to just talk about you know, some of the, you know, it, it's hard. We think, how do we get there from here? Um, and one water number, and I know you talked about water already, but 89% of our consumptive use of water in Colorado goes to ag. 80% of that number goes to grow meat. So when you hear people talking about eating less meat, there's a reason. Um, and agribusiness is huge. They control, they have a lot of power, they control where food moves, how it's processed. So when you think about why can't we change things, there really is an agricultural industrial complex um, that we are dealing with. Um, I know Mark is gonna talk more about this, but I just wanted to note that we've had this history um, that farmers have been led to this path that they have to feed the soil. And instead of the closed loop where you kept your biomass on, on the ground, we now use pesticides and fertilizers and we've become trapped within that. So I'm really excited to hearing more about the um, potential future. Um, Mark's already doing this and, I, and I'll talk a little bit later about how we can get more and more people to do this. Thank you, Alice. I love that there is no time to temper your expectations or actions. So with that segue, uh, Mark Gutridge of Olin Farms. All right, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to be on the panel and for the Longmont Museum hosting. It was uh, about 16 years ago that my wife Ken and I moved back to the family farm that I grew up on. And my grandma Lee bought that property back in the 70s and um, she was a principal and teacher. I grew up there doing 4-H projects and Lee was also a huge fan of the Longmont Museum and volunteered a ton when it was over uh, across the street from the library. And I was thinking about her a bunch when we were driving here today and how proud she'd be to see the museum doing Facebook Live things. It's, it's just crazy to see how far things have come. And so we moved back to the farm. My background was in water resource engineering. I didn't think I wanted to be a farmer, but as we started um, having a garden for our family, I quickly uh, realized that I was in love with soil, and Ken and I realized that the food we were getting out of the garden was just a lot tastier and, and seemed healthier than what we, was available at the store, and we were curious as to why that was. And um, it was all about soil health and, and looking at how the industrial food system has really kind of stripped all the micronutrients out of our soil and the diversity out of our soils and our, um, and our food choices. And so we realized it wasn't just about feeding our family. We really needed to make this uh, available to the, to the whole Longmont and Boulder County community. And that's when we launched Olin Farms as a business. And um, the focus is always on trying to produce the most nutrient dense food possible, like really trying to, to look at food as medicine. And, and realizing that if we're gonna, ever going to have a serious talk about our health or care system, first we need to have a serious talk about our soil systems in this country. And, um, and so for the first 10 years, it was like a, a quest of how do we make that perfect soil microbiome. And, and it's really about physically growing new topsoil. When we first started farming, the carrots were kind of short and nubby. And, and after years of working the soil and making it fluffier and balancing the minerals and getting the carbon in there and getting the microbes in there, now we have like these foot long beautiful carrots. And so that's what carbon sequestration always is to me is like physically building new topsoil. And there's a lot of techniques that, that can be um, utilized. I think NRCS, I mean, we talk about this as farming of the future, but these, these techniques have been around for decades and decades and decades. NRCS has five principles of soil health really that um, and that we model a lot of our systems on, and that's um, number one, minimize uh, disturbance of the, of the soil. That's when you hear more about kind of no-till farming or transitioning more to perennial crops or not having to go out there and till the soil and reset that soil microbiome every single year. The second is um, planting a diversity of crops or really adding diversification to the to the farm and the crops. And I really look at that as diversification in the wildlife that's visiting the farm as well. It's so important to understand that the biodiversity collapse is, is just as critical to this, this planet as the, the warming and the, and, and the crazy climate chaos that's going on. So we really look at the farm as how we can increase the wildlife traffic through our farm. Uh, third is armoring your farm, keeping some of the soil covered. Nature hates bare soil. That's why if, if you see naked soil, that means the carbon's leaving and the weeds are about to move in, and, and that's not what we want. But we have an industrial food system that leaves the ground naked half the year in, in many cases. 
Um, the fourth is um, in incorporating animals into the system, being able to um, have animals on the farm and, and really make them the cornerstone of your nutrition program on the farm. And we do that through composting, through moving our animals around, um, the rotational grazing of our sheep, and then finally keeping a living root in the ground. And that, that's just key. If you don't have that living root, something green above, then you're not photosynthesizing. You're not taking that free, awesome energy coming from the sun and, and capturing it and using it to, to fuel the carbon cycle in the soil. So there's all these practices that have been known for decades. And for early on, Ken and I went to a lot of meetings and government and city, state meetings, trying to advocate for more, more of this on open space, more of this in the state. And the, I realized that at the end, there's just a huge disconnect where there's just not much economic uh, opportunity for farmers to be doing these, these practices. And that's why everybody's still, our food system is still really geared toward the other side of annual tillage and heavy chemical use. And so I realized after many years that we weren't going to be able to change through policy, maybe, or through, or it was just taking too long. We were, Ken and I were getting really frustrated, and so we decided that we were going to spend all our efforts and just like building one example on the south side of Longmont and uh, through our, the land that we own and through another 160 acres of Boulder County open space that we lease, we've launched uh, Project 95 which is partnering with NRCS to make conservation plans so we can layer multiple conservation practices across those properties. And more importantly, it's really getting a direct connection with the community to help fund big perennial tree plantings, to help fund education programs, to help get volunteers out there planting in the ground. And it's been totally amazing. The last couple of years, we planted a couple thousand perennial shrubs, a couple hundred trees, tons of cover crops. And we've really seen the amount of wildlife and diversity just increasing on the farm. And, it's been awesome to see, um, and we'll talk more about how people can get involved. Thank you. Thank you so much. Wow, lots of, uh, not just optimism, but actually such cool stuff on the ground. So I wanted to start on a global level. Alice, you alluded to this today, that there was at least several bits of good news today, meaning President Biden in his summit with several international leaders leading up to COP26 in Glasgow in November pledged that the United States would slash its greenhouse gas emissions at least in half by the end of the decade, and that would be twice as ambitious as President Obama's pledge, and he's called it an economic opportunity of a lifetime, at least of the presidency. Thumbs up, skeptical. I mean, we've had so many pledges, pledges so far into the distance, most of the presidents will be dead and not accountable for their pledges, nonetheless. Uh, Keith, start with you. Thumbs up? Yeah, I think definitely thumbs up. You've got to have uh, ambition. Uh, I think one of the things that, that you see happening uh, increasingly is two things. One, it, with respect to fossil fuel use, you know, we have technologies now that, that we didn't really, at least I never thought we would have uh, this far advanced by this time. So I think that's part of it. The other like thing what, is Could you give just a couple examples there? Well, you know, uh, electric cars, electrification, the fact that, that solar energy now is, is cheaper in many ways than, than fossil fuel is. And, and so it's, you know, I think that's, you know, that, that's key that, that it be, you know, to, to really speed adoption of, of uh, renewable energy is, is, is absolutely key. But I also think that, um, that companies, that, that the general public, but particularly I think corporate America, you know, there may be a certain amount of, of uh, you know, of, of popular uh, pressure of, of maybe even greenwashing, but I, I do think there are some serious commitments from corporate America that are starting to, you know, they see climate change as, it's real, right? And we gotta do something and their futures are in there too. So I think you see uh, movement to commit to reducing emissions throughout their supply chains. And, and, and there is now, over the past you know, just two or three years, it seems like, also an understanding about the, the idea of, of carbon dioxide removal. We need to take it out of the atmosphere. There are different ways to do it. Uh, I think agriculture and the stuff that Mark had talked about is, has huge advantages in the sense that it uh, it can it it can't do it all, but it can contribute to carbon removal. 
and it can have huge co-benefits in terms of you know biodiversity, soil health, soil fertility, sustainable ecosystems, the kind of things that Mark was talking about. So that's why there is a lot of interest really in in soils and and, and climate change mitigation. Uh, you know, it's it's challenging, but it's uh, you know I think it is a reason for for optimism. You mentioned the corporations, a lot of greenwashing for sure, but I thought it was interesting today that as part of all these pledges, it was that richer nations reward countries, particularly developing nations, to put a stop to destroying the tropical forests, and you know, which has been a huge carbon sink, obviously. Um, and as part of that, all these private companies, including, what was it, Amazon, Airbnb, Bayer, Glaxo, McKinsey, Nestle, Salesforce, Unilever, pledged to commit, I think it was one billion plus, to this end. Not just the corporate side, but generally this kind of pledge saying, not only thou shall not destroy the forest, but right, we should be, we the richer nations, maybe the companies as well, but should be part of pain since we're a huge part of the problem. Since you're hooked on policy, Alice, what do you think about that, Alice Madden? Well, I, I definitely give thumbs up to um, what President Biden was talking about today. And just so folks know how important this is, the, the topic tonight, between agriculture and deforestation, we're talking about one quarter of the globe's greenhouse gases. So if you make progress there, you're really, really putting a dent in it. And as I mentioned before, when you do deforest, um, you're taking something that actually, you know, sequesters carbon um, naturally to carbon emissions. I mean, they're, you know, largely uh, for cattle farms, uh, palm oil, and um, growing food for cattle. So deforestation is, is, is something we really have to address, and it takes the world because the Amazon is, you know, surrounded by people who are um, living sometimes at subsistence levels, so it's easy for us here to say that. And then, you know, maybe someone goes has a stake this weekend, and they're saying the Amazon should not be, they should not be cutting down those trees. So you really have to walk the walk yourself. And here in the United States, um, our two biggest sectors are transportation and electricity. And, uh, you know, we've heard, we've made great strides there. So I'm, I began with I'm an optimist, and um, even You're though sticking I'm, to it. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm sticking to it. Thank you, and um, Atreya Bhattacharya, I want to bring you in here because some of the images you showed of human migration related to drought, related to conflict, largely because of drought and extreme weather events, has gone on since millennia ago. How, how does what's happening now, I mean, you could probably point to Darfur and so many of the migration, so many of the conflicts related to climate change not just human conflict, but are we in a much worse state now than many years before? What sort of outlook do you have? Well, that's a great question, Susan. Um, so in my work on just looking at historical documents, as well as working with communities, uh, so I also do climate impacts from a community perspective, uh, I think we are at a larger risk today because we use, for example, the same land and water. For example, in semi-arid environments, we plant and sow water-intensive cash crops. And, and that makes an entire community, entire economic powerhouse of regions, very, very susceptible to even natural climate variability, which is primarily semi-arid, for example, in that area. So we have, I, I think somewhere down the line, maybe 150, 160 years ago, with expansion of colonial economy, we have started prioritizing sort of money over land and water and put ourselves in a box where we are very, very vulnerable to small changes in climate shift and we are really not ready for the kinds of climate shift we are, we are going to experience in the near future. So, and we see people migrating just today because the land is no longer being productive, uh, that people are not being able to take multiple crops. And therefore this problem is not historical, but really modern and future, which is why we look at history to understand what these connections are. 
Uh, so yeah, I think no, we are not safe. We are in fact unsafer. We have far more people to feed. We are in a globally connected food chain and lives and livelihoods are being lost. Cultures are being lost. People are feeling a lot of uh, un discomfort with these changes. And, and uh, mostly people, when you ask indigenous communities, they see that there is a lot of injustice in the world. That's how they perceive the whole thing. Mm -hmm. So I think these are all really problematic things that we need to understand and start addressing in a, in a, in a concrete and comprehensive way. Yeah, thank you. And Mark Gutridge of Olin Farms, you alluded, I don't wanna to get to a lot of your farm practices for sure, but you alluded to a lot of this USDA practices and funding that happened after the Dust Bowl. What's happened with that? I mean, there's obviously still these programs, but from a policy level, a legislative level, bring it down to the ground, do we need a heck of a lot more funding for the kinds of programs that help support, you can define regenerative ag, you know, more not just sustainable, but super healthy agriculture, and can that be possible on big ag scale? I think, well, it's going to have to be possible with time. Yeah. That's our only path forward, really. Um, but yeah, the, it's just an underutilized program, the EQIP program, and a little bit underfunded, and it really takes... Can you decode that? First of all, NRCS, people may not NRCS know NRCS is the National Resource Conservation Service, and they have an EQIP program, which cost shares whenever uh, farmers... Under the are USDA. Doing, right. USDA, yeah. Whenever... Um, the Department of Agriculture cost shares whenever farmers are doing conservation practices that increase soil health. So things like planting hedgerows or starting on farm composting or rotate, getting fences for rotational grazing of animals. But they're just not utilized by farmers. It's a lot of paperwork. The cost shares still makes it questionable whether it's going to be profitable for your business as a, as a transition. So we really need to find other ways to, to build on those and, um, and help them grow and really just get funds and support directly to the farmers. Uh, on the ground. That's where I, I see most of the change taking place. And I think uh, it's great to see policy statements being made and reports coming out, but uh, I just, I feel like sometimes that there's been a lot more statements and reports and there are <laughs> trees actually getting planted and what can we do to make sure that we're actually getting those trees in the ground and actually getting those cover crops planted on larger scales is what Ken and I really are focused on is try to find systems to make that work on the farm. And I think one of the things even more that makes me more hopeful uh, than, than policy statements uh, is um, the youth. Like I see so many young college kids, early 20s, getting out of high school, getting out of college that are so interested in building soil and doing something regenerative for a career. And it scares me because I don't see that many jobs for them. There's so, even C CSU has um, uh, degrees in like conservation, ecology conservation. CU has great environmental stewardship degrees, but all these kids are coming out of there and where do they go to work? There's not farms ready to hire them and put them to work growing soil. So we have a lot come to volunteer on our farm and I'm trying to work with my ideas, but I see a flush of, of new people willing to do the work for the first time in 50 years. We have young people really ready to get their hands dirty but we don't have business systems set up to, to provide employment. So talking about long-term climate goals means nothing to me if we can't get these kids working. Well, first of all, so what do you think is driving that trend line, which sounds, on the surface, really positive? More people wanting to get into it. I mean, kids get it. Kids realize the, the effects of climate change more than adults. So like talking to, to our own daughters and, and the youth, like they, they're, the, kid, the generations are so much more heart connected to the earth and to the, each other and the environment than our generations ever were. And we just have to find ways to, to f foster that and provide them space to be creative. Like we're not gonna come up with the solutions. The kids are gonna come up with the solutions. And that's what Ken and I are trying to provide a platform from preschool age farm tours to learn about five colors on your plate. To, we have a group of CU um, engineering students designing smart systems for different parts of the farm right now to um, high school interns, to just research partners. And it's, it's so important to get these kids involved because they're really the ones that are gonna do the work and carry this forward. We can, we can plant the seed like my grandma planted the seed in me and got me in, in excited about gardening and it blossomed over time. We're just trying to do that same thing for these oh, kids. Well, thanks, and Alice Madden? You wanted to I, I just, I, I w as I did research for this today, I found a, um, a page on the USDA website for new farmers. It was really cool. It's like young farmers, women farmers. Um, and so I started looking for sustainability and carbon farming. 
You looking nothing. for a job, Alice? No. no, no, no. I was looking like, are they teaching people yeah. about this? And that was completely missing. I know there's other programs, but here it's a, it's a page dedicated to new farmers. And this, what a great opportunity to introduce them to that idea right from the beginning. And there was nothing. Well, I'll, I'm going to note that to somebody, so maybe that'll change. <laughs> What about um, another indicator might be at Colorado State University? Are you seeing more or fewer no. students actually wanting to pursue it, whether they're going into soil science to get PhDs yeah, we, or to become farmers or both? So what, I guess one thing I can report is in, in my department, Department of Soil and Crop Sciences, we're actually launching a new regenerative agriculture uh, major as part of the curriculum. So that's been something that's been going on uh, and, and this is, you know, sometimes the universities are, are a little bit behind the times. You know, we look to uh, innovative farmers and, and others to, uh, you know, sometimes to, to lead the way. But, um, but I think there are a number of universities that are, are picking up on this. Um, there's, you know, it, 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 takes a, it takes a lot of different forces to, to turn, you know, a, the ship around, so to speak, to, to really change things. Uh, you know, part of it is, uh, you know, if consumers start to demand the kinds of, of foods and, and the kind of products that, that come from regenerative farming, that will, you know, that'll make a difference. Uh, you know, uh, governments subsidize, not only in the U.S., but, but are really around the world, uh, conventional agriculture primarily in a really big way. I was at a in a, in a conference with, uh, with somebody who was fairly high up in the World Bank, who said something that shocked me at the time. He said, because we're talking about, how, you know, how do we incentivize uh, producers to, to shift to more conservation practices, regenerative practices? And, and a lot of times they say, well, we need to have more funding to, you know, to, to help support uh, you know, adoption of these pra practices. And the, and the guy from the World Bank said, you know, we, we already globally subsidize agriculture with $500 billion a year, and those subsidies go to degradative practices. Maybe we can take that social investment in agriculture and, and funnel it into regenerative practices, conservation practices, things like equip, other things that... That, that Mark mentioned. Um, and, and so there, there are levers out there uh, in terms of you know, consumers and, and, and preferences and, and, and government supports and education and things like that. So I think the, you know, the levers are there, but it, it's, you know, it, it is going to take a lot of work to, to do, but it is something that I think is, is, is possible. You know, we just have to put our shoulders to the wheel. Sounds like it's been aspirational for decades. Would I be asking you this question in 10 years and get the same answer, or is there actually more happening? Like, I know there's been momentum to try to build into the infrastructure bill more funding for NRCS-type practices. Do you see any momentum, or is it more kind of on the edges, important ones, which we'll get into in regenerative ag? I can speak on that, and especially at the higher level NRCS, there's definitely a shift towards soil health. And this was even under the previous administration, probably unbeknownst to the president. There was some the last farm bill that passed uh, under the old administration put more focus on soil health and directed more funding that way. But and I agree completely. Like the subsidies is kind of the shift, and the American public is there for. The last 50, 60 years, we've been paying farmers to grow cheap calories and whatever environmental or health cost is a byproduct of that, no problem. As long as you're pumping out those cheap corn and soy and calories, you're, you're fine. And right now, we're ready to, to, as a public, to start paying farmers to grow health ecosystems instead of cheap calories. The hard part from a policy standpoint is it's very hard to say in numbers, what does a healthy ecosystem look like going forward? And these are the things I know that Keith thinks about all the time too, like how do we put hard data on what an ecosystem moves going forward? And it's not just, the carbon is just one piece of it. You're getting carbon in the ground. How do you measure biodiversity? How do you measure water holding capacity? And how do you layer all these measurements in a very holistic way, which policy is not set up to, to think holistically at all. It's like this many pounds of calories in and out, perfect, pay the farmers ready to go. But we don't have models to really show 
this is what a farm ecosystem looks like moving forward healthily. So that's why as part of Project 95, we're, we're looking at a lot of different data collection techniques, a lot of different um, sensors in the field. That's one of the, the advances in technology that actually allows us to be there. Because now that sensors have become so cheap, we can really mod You mean like to measure soil moisture? Exactly. Everything. Above mm -hmm. the ground, below the ground. We can know exactly how much a rain uh, storm is infiltrating just by moisture sensors. And so how do we get these things calibrated on farms where regenerative practices are taking place so that we can start gathering the data and, and show like, hey, here's the numbers, what it looks like. As soon as we have those numbers that show this is what an ecosystem looks like moving forward, we'll be able to shift the policy. But we're And speaking of numbers, away. and I don't want to reduce farming, as you just alluded, to carbon, but we are talking about carbon and what a huge source of greenhouse gas emissions agriculture has been and what a potential sink it could be or an increasing a larger sink so i wanted to ask you keith postian what is carbon farming and what is some of the data you are producing both i mean you and your colleague mark easter and your team and a bunch of other folks i think are doing a lot of work in this area yeah. sort of pilot projects with farms but sort of give the gist of what is carbon farming and what does some of the data show in terms of soil carbon sequestration healthier soil, mm -hmm. healthier, more nutritious food? Well, I, you know, Mark, in his uh, introductory comments, really, you know, talked about these five principles about keeping a living root in the soil, keeping it covered, you know, uh, maximizing your your productivity and, and, and integrating livestock, et, et cetera. And, and I alluded to that with that simple kind of a box diagram, right, with the carbon in and carbon out. And really, in a sense, that's a, that's a big part of it is, you know, it, as you, as you capture more carbon through photosynthesis, that's also energy that's feeding the ecosystem. Um, you know that that's really important, and, and reducing the disturbance and, and and the other things that we talked about. So the, you know the, the carbon farming, in a sense, is both uh, you know is is as I would say, it's producing your regular agricultural products, but it's also enriching the soil. It's producing other things, you know, we, we refer to it as ecosystem services, right? But those are things like carbon. If, if, uh, if Microsoft wants to offset its emissions and it can't do that entirely just by going to renewable energy, then it is looking to, you know, can, can they incentivize carbon dioxide removals? And there's different ways of doing that. Companies might want to say, well, we will invest in regenerative agriculture as a component of, of carbon dioxide removal. So it becomes, you know, part of a incentive, part of a product that the farmer is producing, not only, you know, not only grain and, and vegetables and stuff, but it's also, you know, clean water, carbon sequestration, uh, you know, biodiversity, pollinators, lots of things like that. So it is a, it is a much more holistic way of looking at things and, uh, you know, and we're trying to, to, it's really being led by the farmers themselves to a large degree and, and, and that have done it and have learned on the ground. But, you know, we're trying to also, you know, capture that knowledge, put it into systems. You know, my group has developed a, uh, something called Comet Farm, which is, is tries to quantify carbon greenhouse gas, but also, you know, water holding capacity and, and other kind of ecosystem processes that allow farmers to, evaluate different practices and get an idea of what might work in a, in a you know, one situation or another. And I think if we take those kind of tools, because we need metrics, right, to manage, if you take those and marry them with the kind of boots on the ground understanding that farmers themselves have, then I think, and the sensors, and so it's, it's almost like marrying modern technology with, you know, common sense and, and sort of, uh, you know, hands in the dirt uh, knowledge of, of, of the system, then I think you, you've got a way to, you know, to, to uh, you know, communicate and, 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 and uh, yeah, and, and, and move forward our knowledge of these systems and, and how, to, how to best, uh, uh, you know, design and, and, and implement them. So obviously not all soil is alike, you know, so varies, as we've talked about before, not only by region, but in a much more granular temporal level. So just give an elevator pitch to a, let's say, pretty large scale farm, farmer. 
why should they employ these practices? And is there economic incentive as well? I'd say Keith Postian, and then we'll Turn that move over around. Mark, he could tell you. Yeah. <laughs> well, do you, trust, do you trust his elevator pitch, which he's kind of given? <laughs> you know, and, and it's hard. Like, it, it's hard to scale, and that's one of the problems with the... Uh, hard to like, scale, you're Boulder saying. With Boulder County Open oh. Space. Like, a lot of uh, these are general practices, like moving animals every eight in different paddocks. There's a ton of moving fences around, and it's... And if we look at Boulder County Open Space as an example, where a lot of our parcels were 100 to 1,000 acre parcels run by uh, one or two farmers with one or two tractors, like it's going to be hard to, to shift away from that chemical use and find alternatives. And um, there's ways to talk about like once the soil health ecosystem goes, you'll have your nitrogen inputs decreased. And there's and a lot of these farmers get it. They're bringing their um, horses or cattle in and, and fertilizing their fields. Like they understand the principles, but to me, it has to be economically driven. Like if we're going to have a conversation with the farmer, it comes down to money. Um, at the scale they are taking their, if they're going to do extra and put extra effort and, and resources into it, they need to get a higher value for their product. And right now we don't have the infrastructure to support those systems where all the grains go into the same grain mills out of the county and how do we, or the same feedlots out of the county and how do we um, be able to like provide an, an economic pathway for farmers as they're scaling up. So that's kind of what we're looking at on the project 95 where we're taking over 135 acres and putting half of that into to pastured um, beef that won't go to like the same beef feedlot as or the packing houses everywhere else, but it'll be sold for a little higher value to people looking for grass fed and higher quality kind of meat products. We're, we're specializing a lot in our um, putting in plums and different perennials as windbreaks within the field and still growing veggies in between, but looking at over time, how do we get uh, crops from those, those perennial trees that, that we're getting some cost shares to plant and make like a gooseberry jam or gooseberry wine and, and use like innovation and, and marketing to really do Yum. it. Yum, got to go to that farm. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to open it up to questions and we have several, but first, um, Atreya Bhattacharya, I want to ask you, since you've done so much work on a global scale and in sub-Saharan Africa and your work in India, where do you see the equity issue come into this? And in what way can more sustainable ag practices, including at scale, at larger scale, help prevent what seems like this increasing climate-driven migration? And food insecurity, it sounds so abstract, but those who can't reach or can't afford. Like it's one thing to say, stop eating meat or eat meat once a week. And from a climate perspective, obviously that'd be a good thing. But what about from sort of a, a poverty and social equity standpoint? How do, you, how do you see things? Well, Susan, I think uh, I'm kind of relearning. As you pointed out that my work as a paleo climate scientist has been primarily looking at natural archives things where human beings did not impact things. But over time, I've sort of moved into more recent times and more local. And one of the things that I'm finding out is the answer lies in asking members of the community who are impacted. Uh, that's, uh, that's something that's largely missing in our discourse, I feel. Uh, we tend to assume a lot of things. And when I go out in the field and talk to people, I get a completely different answer. Uh, and, and I think that uh, a solution space should start, start with getting people involved in formal sort of studies and understanding. Uh, and that I think would be very critical, but doing so in, for example, this work in semi-arid regions in Maharashtra, uh, in India, uh, my, my, my learning has been that most people tend to think of dams that restrict flow of waters and only make water available to the rich farmers tend to be reasons why people leave the land and leave and go away. Uh, so some of our solutions may be quite simple and local and policy level, where we can think of infrastructures from all communities, upstream, downstream, far away from water sources uh, or any other natural resources, that would be a way to think about the solution. And at a local level rather than a global level, that would be my two cents on this. 
Mm, thank you. That's a huge point, starting whether you're a researcher or not, but what does this community need? What do people actually need besides prescribing from above? So I want to open up to questions. I think we have several, and let's see what you all have to say and ask. Thank you. Justin, what do we got? We have a qu question from Martin, or yeah, Martin on Facebook. He says, the Allen Savory Institute in Boulder is making, frankly, unbelievable claims that their holistic management and planned grazing can reverse climate change. Do you have evidence either way? Great Are you question. familiar with this? Well, I can. Keith Postian, you want to take so, that one? Well, what I would say is there, you know, there's a lot of interest in uh, you know, in, in improved grazing systems that can potentially <clears throat> uh, inc increase soil carbon. There, there are uh, a recent study that uh, has been, been funded by a number of different folks that have, have looked at um, and, you know, look, looked at, at carbon storage. And it, it does look like, you know, this kind of uh, regenerative or, or sorry, uh, rotational kind of intensive uh, grazing, it can in some cases increase soil carbon significantly. I, I do worry that, uh, you know, a lot of times people are looking for silver bullet solutions. They say, hey, you know, if we just did all organic agriculture, if we just did, you know, savory grazing, everywhere that's enough to uh you know to, to offset all our emissions and things like that and and there really is uh you know we we need to be careful we, uh, to to reduce emissions to uh you know stabilize the climate is going to require that we do just about everything we can in all different sectors you know whether it's from renewables uh you know dietary changes uh, conservation practices halting deforestation, you know, it's going to take all of those different levers and there's not one single, uh, you know, activity or intervention that is going to, uh, is going to, uh, you know, solve the, the climate problem. It's, it's re really going to be, uh, you know, everything we can, can muster in, in all activities of, you know, of the economy, I think it's going to take. The Grand Canyon Trust is a site that Martin might want to look at too. They're doing some really cool studies. Say that name again. Sorry. Grand Canyon Trust. And you can think about the land that they're grazing on. But they're not only gathering that information, they're sharing it with all the other ranchers in the area. So I'm sure you can look that up pretty easily. Thank you. And I trade Bhattacharya, you had something? Yes. Uh, I wanted to add on to what Keith just mentioned that it's not one single solution. And those solutions would be very, very uh, specific to communities at a local scale. Uh, and that would have to come from their livelihoods, where, how they perceive the land changing. And therefore, there, I completely agree with Keith. There's no one solution, but sort of these bags that we know work and is also corroborated by communities. But it really has to come from those communities uh, rather than us telling everyone what they should be doing from a global perspective. Great point. Next question. On that note, uh, Tom wants to know what's the best way to incentivize farmers to use healthy soil practices? Great I, question, Alice. Would you mind putting up my last slide? Um, this was, I had a slide about the government role and um, and I actually wanted to point out kind of a, a problem with that. So I couldn't believe this number. 90% of our farms are family farms. Some are bigger than others. Um, and you, you think about, you know, how government can help. Well, one thing is grants. And there is so much money in the federal government um, for farming. However, you, you know, do you, have, do you have a grant writer on staff? <laughs> I mean, that's the problem. These farms don't always have the capacity to actually get to this money, so it almost might as well not even be there. So we have to really think about meaningful access to money. And of course, the other thing is continuing to fund uh, research and development. So I just wanted to make sure um, folks just kind of thought about some of these conundrums. Thank you. Next question. Um, and Richard on Facebook wonders if it would help if more people planted their own gardens and use community gardens rather than purchasing produce from the store. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah ab- Mark, abs- I think you have something to say about that. Absolutely. Um, it's going to take a community effort. There's no one solution, but the, but it's a, just a frame of, of thinking. Like if Boulder County wants to be sustainable, and I think 10 years ago when they did a study, less than 2% of the food we actually eat here comes from here. That's an F minus, minus, minus on sustainability. Like until we can be, get serious and start growing a lot of our own food locally and be more resilient, um, and that's going to start with the home gardener. It's going to start with going and finding local farms, doing good things and supporting them, going and, and volunteering on farms, even investing in farms. Like we do have had some government grants, some NRCS funding, um, but it is, it's a ton of paperwork, it's a ton of time, it's often receipts submitted and then you get money at the very, very end where some of our private donors that provide pollinator seeds is boom, we got them in the ground the next week. So some of our private donors that sponsor a couple interns to work at the summer at, through the farm all summer, boom, we have people on the ground that summer getting things done. So really it's the, uh, the communities where I see the most groundswell and actual change taking place. And it can be in your raised bed garden behind your house to doing some gorilla um, pollinator planting around your neighborhood and don't tell your HOA. Like just, we have to, just gotta all work on it together and, and, and support the people that are doing it and, and put the tools in their hands that need to get it done. Oh, so you're saying only 2% of food we eat in Boulder County Comes from is Boulder grown County. in and Boulder prob- County. Is that pretty <laughs> typical, you think, nationwide? I mean, depending yep. on the community? Outside of California, yeah. probably. Wow. And then yeah. there's the carbon equation. It's not necessarily bad that it's transported, but you're talking and about more from a resilience yeah. standpoint. Next question. Okay. Here's one from Michael. Since meat production is such a major contributor to greenhouse gas emissions and water consumption and water consumption, it would make sense to quickly eliminate much of that production. However, the path to quickly reduce reduce those emissions by eliminating such activity would devastate the industry and thus the multitude of employees, ranchers, etc. Similar to what has happened in the coal industry. What are ways we can effectively and quickly reduce this type of emissions while providing for the financial and employment well-being of the many folks that would be affected? That's such a great question and so important to look at the economics, the communities, the livelihoods. Who wants to take a first crack at that? I, I, Alice, I, I will, not that I have an answer, but um, <laughs> it, is, it is so difficult to shift away. I mean, we hear this same problem with uh, natu- you know, natural gas. You know, what, what are we going to do? Oh, um, we're gonna hurt this industry uh, if we, you know, force a shift to renewable energy. Well, just today I was talking to someone, we have all these uncapped wells that occasionally explode and kill people. You know, you could train people who work in natural gas industry to help cap these, you know, hundreds of thousands of abandoned wells out there. Um, with, with, with the cattle industry, you know, again, you have a lot of family ranches, some bigger than others. Um, you know, the, the, the deal they get to graze on public land is a pretty darn sweet deal. So if you think about free market approaches, one of those would be to actually charge, you know, what a market price would be to, to, to graze on our land. That's what, you know, we pay our taxes for. So just shifting um, some more truly free market approaches um, would, I think, you know, start creating a shift in that industry. Um, I'm not a vegetarian, but I don't eat very much meat at all anymore. Um, and just because I know the, the, the huge dent this puts um, in our any attempt we have to deal with this. So, um, but there are, I think, some more sustainable um, growth practices. Part of the problem is if you fed your cattle something else that didn't take so much don- darn water to grow, that would be a huge part of the problem. But they're not doing that. So they grow water-intensive plants and crops to feed the cows. That's something you could shift, and that's something the government could help shift. I just add to that. I it, I also think that there's a you know there is a place for livestock, but probably you know from a environmental or ecological standpoint, it's uh, you know I I think if livestock can be more integrated into the into the production system, and Mark alluded to this, it's you know if you have livestock there you can utilize and, and, and make a profit from growing cover crops and things like this that otherwise, if you, if you don't have a, an animal there to, cons, 
to consume that and turn it into protein, turn it into products, then, then the farmers aren't able to, 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 to use some of those tools in the regenerative uh, toolbox. So, and, I, and I'm not sure if, if it would necessarily have such a huge impact on labor, but you know, for sure, industries are gonna have to shift um, and, and you know, I guess that's the role of government to try to, uh, to help ease the, you know, the social pain and, and difficulties with those kind of transitions. But it's the same as you said, natural gas, petroleum. You know, if we're going to get away from fossil fuels in, you know, in, in 20 years or whatever, um, there's going to be a lot of folks that, that were working in the oil patch that need to do something else. Or like the coal miners, it's not a, you know, it, and it, it sounds flippant, but for sure, uh, I think it's always been that way. As as industries change, transition, uh, you know, we've got to we've got to deal with that in a in a in a way that that uh, you know that that benefits people that they can change into you know new careers, new jobs. Uh, it's it's not easy, but you know we're going to have to do it somehow. So, in closing, <clears throat> I want to give each of you a chance <clears throat> to just share something that is particularly inspiring you these days or keeping you up at night along these lines. Uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, how about you first? Kind of difficult to say one thing prescriptive, but I Well, do in 30 think seconds, you could say three things. <laughs> Sorry, what? I said you can have 30 seconds. You could say three things if you want, but in closing. Yes. Uh, so the first thing is, uh, I think in Boulder, we have... Uh, a unique advantage is that there are so many scientists, so many practitioners who are working on different types of this to be really plugged into that kind of resource that we have with public lectures, workshops, symposiums. Uh, that would be one thing. The second thing would be to understand your communities. Why do people do the, how do people use resources? What is the cultural dimension of why they do it? And the third thing would be really conscious of, of the fact that water and soil are uh, non-renewable in many ways. For example, soil takes a million years to form, and the, and the faster you erode it, or uh, the, the, you're pretty much losing soil. So really thinking about how you manage soil, uh, how is your diet impacting, is, it, is your diet local, are you sourcing stuff from local places, those would be Sort of from the big picture to immediate household stuff that I would recommend. Thank you. Mark Gutridge of Olin Farms, one or two things, 30 seconds or less. <laughs> sure. I think um, the thing that inspires me is just the interest of people to, to get involved and help out on the farm to make a change. I think uh, I'll put a plug for uh, Wildlands Restoration Volunteers, as WRV as they're known locally. Uh, I think they have decades of experience leading volunteer activities. Traditionally, it was like doing trail reconstruction in the mountains. So they have a wing right now that's really focused on getting on local regenerative farms and doing and bringing in big volunteer groups to knock out projects. And we've hosted like three big perennial plantings with them already and have more on the calendar. If you go to their website, you can see how to get out on the farm. And we always start those days with me kind of explaining exactly what we're doing and why we're doing it so people can take those skill sets back home and learn all about biological inoculants and fungi and biochar and lava rock and <laughs> cover crops, pollinator stuff. We go, we go through it all real quick. So if you are interested in the practice techniques, Look up WRV, come out for a volunteer day at Olin Farms. We're going to be doing them all summer long, all COVID safe. Everybody at WRV brings us their own shovels, their own tools. It's a super easy way to get involved and make a difference. And for those of you in other states, perhaps, and certainly other counties, there are farms doing this kind of stuff. Absolutely. Maybe not as well, but Find so your local opportunities farmers. around. Alice Madden, how about you? So we know what to do. We just often lack the political will to do it. And you think about the change that has um, happened to this country in the last year, because of some horrible events, but the awareness of uh, racial injustice and the change that was demanded by Americans, that same energy, that same sort of commitment, if it turned also to environmental injustice and climate injustice, I think that would help force elected officials make the decisions they need to make in a timely manner. Because again, as I started, we don't have a lot of time and we need to help our policymakers get there as fast as we can. Thank you. Keith Postian. Yeah, I, well, I think Allison and, and Mark and 
that had, all, you know, everyone's uh, said it said it well. But I, I, you know, to me, it's it's we need to really be bold in our thinking. We need to kind of fundamentally reimagine what our landscapes can look like, and and it's a huge lift, right? Uh, but in a way, if we don't have that kind of imagination. Uh, then we're not going to get there, and I, I think it, it's it's fundamental, you know, education awareness. Uh, it has to be uh, to a large degree. I think it's got to be a bottom up kind of an approach that that eventually, you know, leads to to changes at in in policy and 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 uh, you know and governance as as part of it. But you know, I think we really need to to have this. Imagination and and kind of awareness and yeah and and just just like was was said before it, you know we really need to to do that transformation and it it'll be a huge lift but at the end of it you know we'll th there's there's reason to be optimistic because it can be a much better world in the end if we can achieve some of these changes. I'm into that. Well, I want everyone to join me in thanking our panelists so much. We have Dr. Aitreyi Bhattacharya, good morning to you in Mumbai, <laughs> and Dr. Keith Faustian from Colorado State University, Alice Madden of CU, the Getchus Wilkinson Center, I won't say the rest of it, <laughs> and Mark Gutridge, Olin Farms. Thanks so much, everyone. And thank you, Justin Beach and the Longmont Museum, our sponsor, KGNU, and mostly all of you. It's been a great week. And thank you, Susan, and for all of you for tuning in. There are a bunch of people I want to thank before we close out our Big Picture Climate Change series for 2021. Um, I want to thank all of the panelists who have joined us over the past four days. Uh, Sarah Shirazi and KGNU Community Radio, Sustainable Resilient Longmont, the City's Sustainability Program, and especially the co-curator and moderator of the Big Picture Climate Change series, Susan Moran. You're a total pro. Attuned to every little detail, your considerable interview skills have been a wonder to behold over the last four days, and we're all the better for it. Thank you. I'd also like to give a special shout out to the city's Climate Action Task Force and Peter Wood, who provided the vision that inspired the series, Adara Nusrat, Francie Jaffe, and Lisa Knobloch with the City of Longmont for their support and encouragement. The staff at, the Longmont, at Longmont Public Media, thank you. Museum staff, including Scott Stewart, Scott Yoho, Jim Fladmark, and our intern, Aubrey Presswich. Thank you out there for tuning in. Happy Earth Day. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Sorry, say that again. Oh, it is a great way to start the day. It's it's less it's less exciting than taking a run outside, but it's next best thing. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Yes, me as well. Take care. You have a great evening.